Hello and welcome. Uh, my name is Jeannie Hoffman. I'm one of the co-directors for the Northwest Regional Spinal Cord Injury Model System and I want to welcome you tonight to our forum. Um, the forums, the recordings, and our, all of our online media content are made possible by an in, a grant from the National Institute on Disability and Rehabilitation Research. And tonight we're pleased to have four panelists who have been, will be talking about different ways um, that they have had experience with advocacy, from advocating t for themselves on a very personal level to the transition out um, into the community to talking about advocating for um, larger causes and improving the lives of others locally and nationally. Um, each panelist will, t will talk for about 10 to 15 minutes and give their um, background and information. We may follow up with some questions, but then we'll certainly invite questions from the audience at that point. Um, we'll also have time in between each presenter if you have specific questions for that presenter. So first I'd like to just do an overview and um, have ask actually each person to introduce themselves and just a brief overview of your injury and then we'll get started. So Todd, would you mind just introducing yourself and just a brief overview? Yeah, uh, evening. Uh, my name is Todd Strobelfeld, uh, 31 years old and I'm a complete C4 quadriplegic, 2-2-A gunshot uh, back in 1987. Hi, my name is Aditya, and I'm 27. Um, I had a motorcycle accident, and I fractured C5, um, and I'm incomplete. My name is Tom Rainey. I was injured on the East Coast back in 1998 in a non-diving board-related pool injury. I was a bit shallow due to the construction, and I've done a lot of advocacy work, and that's why I'm here. I'm Bruce Hansen. I uh, uh, suffered a C6 injury in 2001 in a skiing accident. Uh, I'm uh, 55 years old now, and uh, I'll be talking more about other stuff. All right, so I want to just get started and have Todd talk a little bit about his self-advocacy. Self-advocacy, that's a, sort of a hard one to describe. It's uh, you know, been in the well, 31 years of the making, I guess, specifically the last 24 to 25 uh, due to the injury. Uh, part of my story is you're going to, I guess, understand a little bit how I grew up. Uh, so uh, I was injured at eight years old, second grade going into third grade, and uh, I did my rehab at Children's Hospital. And that was, of course, uh, 87 and on into 88. And the rehab back then was just totally different. I was in the hospital for over a year, and uh, that was my home. And uh, when I got home, I was home for maybe an hour, and my mom told me that um, she'd let me stay in the home till I was 20. So she gave me two years of what she called grace, and that was considered in her terms called tough love. And so uh, by the time I was 20, I should be on my own, either full-time student or in a career. I took that to heart and ended up leaving my uh, parents' home at 16 to uh, pursue a, a software development as a trade. Uh, I wanted to be a physician and uh, quickly realized and learned that at 16 um, this great country is not set up for uh, disabled people to have any sort of ambition. And um, the response was, I'm either going to be on the state for the rest of my life or I'm not going to be on the state at all and uh, with a C4 injury need to make a lot of cash as fast as I can. Uh, it just so happened to be that was the mid-90s, and uh, this thing called the Internet was started, and there was these uh, things called websites, and uh, ended up working out uh, in my favor, and I ended up uh, actually getting a job uh, just a few days after I turned 18 with a software company, and um, that's where I've been ever since. So that's sort of the big picture. How do you do that? How does that all work? How does it come together? Um, this has been sort of my, my solution. I look at my life in, as a series of projects, uh, and I am the manager of that, uh, which seems probably sort of strange to systematize my life, uh, but it works for me. I, I sort of use the Michael Gerber approach to uh, franchising a business like McDonald's. I've just sort of franchised my body, and, uh, and uh, thank you. I appreciate the joke. It's okay to laugh at a quadriplegic. All right. And uh, and so what I do um, is uh, very systematically 
look at each component um, as its own individual piece and then all combined and together makes up sort of me and I feel that it's important to always uh, professionally um, sort of uh, conduct myself in a way that uh, articulates to whoever my audience is whether that's a physician in an ER that has no idea what autonomic dysreflexia is and does not understand the next steps uh, so being able to um, professionally coach him, talk with him in a way that uh, would uh, want, sort of allow him to buy in to my situation rather than me use a sort of I'm disabled, listen to me, you don't know my story type deal. More of a, hey, let's work on this together, you know, as a, as a solution that will both benefit the both of us. Uh, so I, I just take that wherever I go. I mean, this, like I said, it doesn't really matter. It's a you know, if it's the clinic here at the U or ER or, you know, trying to find a job, you know, or trying to resolve, you know, problems with family, friends, or relationships. Uh, I find for me, um, typically coming to the table, if you will, I'm, uh, I got to sort of prove myself. I don't know why um, people think that disabled folks are, you know, not all together, whether they're mentally, you know, con cognitively, uh, I just feel like um, whenever I come to uh, a table, let's see if I'm meeting clients or whatnot, I always have to sort of be the best dressed in the room. I have to be able to speak uh, better than my counterparts and be able to show them that, uh, yes, I am, in fact, disabled. Uh, but I have a mind, and it works well, and, and I'm able to use it to, you know, to meet the needs. And that's just a, a solution that I have come up with. Um, I think it works really well. I uh, I try to show other people and teach other folks. Uh, I don't know why most folks in chairs end up having sort of a s sort of interesting entitlement and uh, sort of you know you owe me. Um, in my philosophy, nothing was ever promised to us, and nobody ever said this sort of you know earth suit was going to be easy. And so for me, I uh, I try to do what I think works for me, and that is always trying to have people buy into my situation, my story, and that um, we can work as a team and that we can solve you know, problems. And that's sort of uh, the approach I've done for the last several years. Of course, it's always been you know, under refinement. Of course, sometimes you get really pissed and you don't feel very good and, uh, and it leaks out a little bit like anybody else. We all have bad days. Um, <coughs> when I teach uh, third grade, I, I do a lot of um, discussion on, on approaching people, like strangers and whatnot. And, uh, and that it's okay to ask questions. It's okay to be uh, curious. I'm not sure why we're sort of taught to not be that when we get older, um, but uh, I find that to be a great way to uh, sort of uh, cultivate uh, discussion and for uh, folks that are, you know, let's say strangers in the mall to be able to understand my situation and for me to be able to understand them too. Uh, I guess that uh, for me you could sum up my approach on almost everything in life is a, is a sort of a professional, uh, calm, uh, as best spoken as I can be, and that um, I would like for you to join me on this adventure rather than me tell you how this is going to work. Um, the situation already is odd and strange. Here there's this, you know, quadriplegic in an ER, you know, in rural America, you know, Shelton, Washington, and the doc's never seen, you know, somebody with my situation, and I, I know exactly what I need, but how, how do we get to that end goal? And so there's a, you know, so tell me about your story, doc. You know, where'd you go to school? Uh, what do you like to do? You know, that type of deal is uh, get to the sort of relational side of, of people, which I think we all... And sort of uh, innate, have this uh, desire to be uh, in a relationship, to be able to speak uh, heart to heart from different people, and that's uh, that's sort of my approach. And uh, so far, it's worked. So, it's, uh, can you talk a little bit about your foundation and kind of how that came about with your advocacy? Absolutely. Uh, so I started the Todd Sobelfeld Foundation uh, a few years ago. And it specifically uh, works with occupational therapists, whether they're in school or on the field. And um, my uh, desire and goal is to create a social-driven um, network 
where C1 to C4 quads work directly with OTs to become the next standard of usability guidelines for the for the world and um, that's where I'm heading and I think that it's important it's sort of the idea let's say everybody here in, in this room has a cell phone and it has a speech recognition application probably most made by a company called voice signal which is owned by a company called nuance which makes drag and dictate we've all probably heard of that um, why don't we design speech rec for the quadriplegic I know in that answer if it's designed for the quadriplegic it'll work for everybody that's our life right um, and then uh, you sort of got to show these people that uh, it's the bottom line really it's how business and people move forward so if um, we can design the speech rec app for the quad slightly tooled and designed now you can take over the automated world because everybody wants to talk on their phone by pressing a button on the rearview mirror or whatever it is um, so that's my goal using OTs and, and other high-level quads to uh, basically change the world. That's where I'm going. And for UC5 and lower quads, sorry guys. I, I got no interest in that. So Deetja, why don't you tell us a little bit about the advocacy you've done from kind of going out into the community, that transition, and back into school. Sure. Um, so I, like I said, I got injured in a motorcycle accident in New York. Um, and I was 19 at the time and living at uh, my friend's house. Um, I had no family there, my parents were deceased. And so I was living at my friend's house and didn't have a social network there besides friends. And my uncle and aunt were living out here in Seattle and on sabbatical. They offered to have me come out here. And so uh, I came out here as soon as I could, did the rest of my rehab and it was during rehab when PTs, OTs, doctors, and nurses, especially one nurse in particular, uh, my primary nurse then, uh, emphasized the role of advocacy in probably the most important part of um, someone with a disability, with a physical disability, that significantly impacts their um, daily functions. And that is um, just directing their care, right? So I, there's, back then there were a lot more things that I couldn't do. Um, I wasn't moving my arms very well, and therefore I needed help with pretty much every every aspect of my day. And if you can't, like Todd said, uh, articulate how you want to do this, um, how you would like it to be done, um, it's not only a comfort issue or a, um, maybe a preference issue, because those things will become frustrating and um, uh, a little bit annoying when something isn't done your way. But that's not a big deal. It becomes a big deal when you need to advocate for yourself when something's wrong. For example, um, to put on your jacket the right way so there's no wrinkles, or um, to put on, to um, walk you through, so to speak, um, a situation where you're having a medical emergency, like you're in an ER, for example, and the doctors there haven't heard of dysreflexia since med school. So these type of things were um, uh, these type of things were really important um, were a really important learning uh, tool to uh, demonstrate how how important um, directing your care was now after that, my advocacy was still personal. I needed to move out of the hospital because, like Todd said, in uh, hospital stays for people with spinal cord injuries, especially higher level injuries have gotten dramatically shorter from you know, over a year to a few months to you know, several weeks now. Um, and that's partially due to insurance and other factors, but the point is you need to, most people usually go to their families if they have um, a good family su structure, or if not, they go to um, whatever, uh, wherever they can find. And in my case, that was um, temporarily a nursing home. Um, Unfun, unfun. I don't recommend it. Um, so that was only for two weeks, but um, just getting in the nursing home um, was difficult enough. And fortunately, I had a team of people helping me. Um, I wasn't doing this all alone. I had an aunt and an uncle who were doing um, what they could, and social workers, caseworkers. Um, but once you get in there, then the next thing you immediately think of is, how the hell do I get out, right? And so getting into a 
um, getting into a um, group home was the, my next challenge. A group home, an adult family home, is uh, a, a home that has several individuals, more than two, that require some level of care. So in order to find these homes, you, you had to do networking, calling, um, finding out whether they would um, uh, be able to meet your level of care, whether they'd be able to help you out with all that you needed during the day. So this was a lot of, a lot of things. This was a lot to think about um, while I was still, you know, basically recovering. And so fortunately I had help there too. But I had to go to a few different group homes because one just didn't work out. Um, the other one had problems with the state. And so it was a, it was a continual process. And it, it turns into a, uh, a situation, a skill of, uh, of necessity because most, most of us up here didn't learn, probably didn't learn to be advocates, um, you know, just because we like doing it. At least I didn't in my case. I did it because you need to get stuff done. You need to be looking out for your health. Um, you need to find a place to live. Um, so all of these things um, prompted me to become more outgoing. I was kind of introverted when I was in high school. Uh, I wasn't very good at speaking with people. Um, so all of this kind of changed my personality. Um, from there, um, from the group home, I finally, the next big hurdle was getting into an independent living situation, which was um, fairly serendipitous for me. I had a nurse delegator at my group home who was friends with another nurse who was friends with a mom whose son was a quadriplegic. And so the mom, Suzanne, um, asked me whether I'd like to come over sometime just to hang out. And they said, well, you know, we have an extra room. You can move in with us if you'd like. It'd be great to have that social structure um, set up, um, social support. And so, great, I found a place to live. Easy, easy, right? Well, no, because state bureaucracy is wonderful. And um, <laughs> in order to, you know, maneuver through that, you have to be pretty resilient and flexible and realize that it's not just difficult individuals that are in these positions, maybe social workers or um, different administrative folks, but there's lots of institutional factors that whenever you're advocating for yourself or on behalf of someone else um, will tend to limit how much you can do through that channel. And so not taking no for an answer is a good, uh, very good um, trait to have and it's difficult sometimes more when you're advocating for yourself more um, easy to do that when it's on behalf of a loved one so finally you know we made calls um, I called an ombudsman um, put you know enough pressure um, found a caseworker that was in King County I was in Snohomish um, to facilitate the move and long story short you know I, I finally got into the new place um, and soon after uh, started school again at the UW because I, was, I wasn't going to be able to go to school from a group home. It's just not cool. It's just <laughs> not, not, not going to happen. Um, yeah, so after that, um, I guess, yeah, um, that, that was most of the uh, personal advocacy I did. And um, like I said, being flexible and um, persistent is uh, those are two really good traits to have. Um, persistency um, is probably the most important when you're advocating for yourself in the situations like this. Yeah. Steve. You know, it seems like the network really worked for you, but you were kind of shy before but you kind of rose to the occasion. Can you talk about how you achieved coming out with the strength of your personality and developing your network? Drugs. Drugs and <laughs> booze. No. Um, um, no, I, it was slow. You know, in the hospital, in my, in my room up on 8 North, I didn't want to leave ever. 
Um, I think like I think some smart PTs um, sent in sent in a cute looking PT and finally got me to like leave and go and drive around the hospital. <laughs> but um, yeah, but really, I I didn't want to go because I was in a lot of pain and I was you know kind of grumpy and that I just wanted to be left alone and. It changed from that little by little to the realization that no one else is going to, you can't do a lot of stuff yourself anymore. Like just coming over that, that hurdle of denial is, uh, was a big factor for me. And once you realize you can't do that, you're going to need to find someone that is willing to help you out, which there's more than enough people here in Seattle, especially. Um, and you know, after that, you, you just learn to talk to people um, better, um, learn to relate, and like Todd said, you know, turn it into a situation where you're not just demanding um, help from someone, but, you know, you're, you need assistance with something, and you're making a plea to work with you. Again, I'm Bruce Hansen, and uh, like I said earlier, I... Uh, I have a C6 spinal cord injury from a skiing accident in 2001. <clears throat> and uh, yeah, I've done a lot of advocacy for myself and for other things. Uh, for my, my, it took me, you, I am ambulatory, and uh, it took me, I spent really four years of work to get to the point where I can walk. And that has led me, I, I presently serve uh, as chair of the board of directors of Pushing Boundaries, which is a nonprofit that does exercise therapy for people with paralysis. Uh, but that's not what I'm here. What I'm <laughs> here to talk about directly. Uh, I've done uh, adv legislative advocacy in Olympia and in Washington D.C., and that started uh, in uh, 2002. I worked on the campaign for a local woman in my district who was running for the State House of Representatives. And she won. And at the same time, I had uh, been, uh, I'd been hooked up with some people uh, that I met through CareCure, the CareCure website. Are people familiar with that here? Yeah. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's an interesting website, to say the least. And, and I found just some immensely really useful information there. There's also some pretty bizarre information there, but that's also another story. Uh, but I met some people who were doing something called Quest for the Cure. And this was a group of people in states across the country who were trying to get bills passed since roughly half of spinal cord injuries come from motor vehicle accidents. They were pushing to get a uh, ticket surcharge added to motor vehicle moving violations to be applied to spinal cord injury research. And there are some states that were actually successful in the 90s and early 2000s. Uh, one in particular is Kentucky. And uh, uh, the L University of Louisville in particular has some really amazing research going on because of the money they've been raising through that. New York is another one, uh, California. Uh, unfortunately, things. You know, we got a bill introduced. Uh, I guess it seemed cool. Oh, we've got a bill. You know, well, this is a good cause and it'll pass. You know, and these people, well, it, uh, it put around and it died in committee. And um, that's actually, that's what happens to most bills that get introduced in uh, both the state legislature and uh, in Washington, D.C. Um, but it was at least the beginning for me to learn about you know, going to meet with these people. And l legislators and their staff l love to hear from constituents and love to meet people. And um, it's really, um, sometimes it seems daunting, like they're in an ivory tower. But they are, they are approachable, and they do want to hear from us. Um, I, through that process, got hooked up with some other folks, with a uh, particular woman uh, in, from the Juvenile Diabetes Foundation who are advocating in Olympia for some bills about stem cell research in Washington, I mean, in, in Washington State. And I testified at a number of committee hearings about that topic. 
and also spent time down in Olympia going from legislative office to legislative office, just talking to some of the people there. And that was also, um, that was an interesting experience as well. I think one of the things I learned about that is to really know not just, not just what you're going to say, but what uh, people who oppose your, uh, uh, you know, what their arguments are and how to counter them. I had one uh, time I testified at, uh, before the State Senate, and uh, um, after I had gone and maybe a few other people who were pro um, stem cell research, and uh, I very much uh, support it. Uh, one of the other state senators came in and she had brought in a ringer from California, a physician who told this crazy story about, uh, I mean, a really wrenching story about uh, her daughter who was born with a congenital um, issue uh, and died at a uh, rather awful death at 18 months. And she's telling the story and then she said, um, some of the effect of this, um, I equate the life of my daughter to be the same as the life of every embryo. And uh, maybe there are, you know, and to me it, it was really, um, it was really hard to listen to that because that is not the way I see the world. And uh, I also talked to somebody else who had referred to somebody, another person I know, about who had been to Portugal for some treatment with uh, a doctor there who was implanting olfactory cells uh, in people's spinal cords and this person misrepresented this other person's experience quite significantly. So it's, um, it's really, um, uh, it really helps to know and, and maybe in those cases there wasn't much I could do but uh, the final area I want to talk about was my experience going to Washington, D.C. advocating for a bill called the Christopher and Dana Reeve Paralysis Act. And it, uh, uh, I forget when it was, it was introduced first in Congress there, around 2000. And it would be introduced and it would languish and it would then be reintroduced for the next session and languish. And some folks, uh, three women who met on character, two with spinal cord in injuries and a third who had a son with a spinal cord injury, decided that they were going to do some grassroots advo advocacy. Uh, the Christopher Reeve Foundation was sponsoring this bill and helping to lobby for it, but they weren't really doing much grassroots work. So they organized a rally in Washington, D.C., and they also organized a science symposium. Uh, called Working to Walk. I'm going to talk about that just a little more. But anyway, I didn't go to the first one of those, but I did go to the second one uh, with my wife Kate here. And we traveled there. And we went, part of the time we spent, we went around Capitol Hill visiting our uh, uh, Senator Murray's office, Senator Cantwell's office, and uh, we live on the east side, uh, Representative Reichert's office. And uh, that, again, was really, really cool experience to go there, to, uh, to be in those halls. I, I, you know, I am ambulatory, but when I was there, I, I can't walk that far. Um, I was wheeling, so wheeling around these big halls in these office buildings and uh, talking with these folks was really, um, was really amazing. Uh, I want to talk particularly about our experience with Senator Cantwell because the first time we went there, we went and met with um, her health care aide. And um, this person really didn't seem too friendly and didn't really want to talk to us and didn't know anything about the bill. We'd been to Senator Murray's office and Senator Murray was a co-sponsor of the bill and her aide knew about it and, you know, it was really interesting to talk to them, and we went to Senator Cantwell's office, and oh, it just so we we just started talking. Well, this is what the bill is, and this is why, and she raised some objections and all that, and we kind of had some answers. But uh, the next year we went, and she had a different aide, who was turned out to be much more knowledgeable, and he did know about 
this bill and did spend time talking with us and asking questions and raising objections. And uh, um, and we asked, we still asked Senator Cantwell to sign on as a co-sponsor. She was not a co-sponsor. Uh, the third year, um, I actually did not go there. Kate did. Um, I was unable to travel there, but while that was going on there, I decided, well, I'm here. What can I do? Well, I can pick up and call these people on the phone. So I did that. And then I also um, sent out to everybody I knew in my email list um, some talking points. You know, Senator Cantwell, we were, we were targeting her to get more co-sponsors to this bill to get it pushed through the Senate because it was there was one senator who had put a an anonymous hold on the, on the bill, so it was like bound up. So we were getting more co-sponsors. Senator Cantwell still hadn't signed on. Um, so we called. I sent it out to my whole email list, and it included some folks who were older and retired and had some time on their hands. And a number of them called and talked to them, and you know, and told me specifically they had done that. And anyway, about two weeks later, Senator Cantwell signed on as a co-sponsor. And then later. Well, it was early 2009. It passed through the Senate and through the House, and uh, President Obama signed it in March of 2009. A bill that helps uh, support paralysis research, paralysis rehabilitation and care, uh, clinical trials networks, um, quality of life. And I think in particular, clinical trials are really important. You may have heard that yesterday, um, uh, a person in, I believe in Atlanta, was uh, treated with embryonic stem cells, a person with a spinal cord injury, in really the first clinical trial of this sort of thing uh, in the United States. And that's really very cool. Uh, and it getting um, something from the laboratory to clinical trials is really difficult. Finally, I want to close. I mentioned this, uh, this conference, Working to Walk. It's uh, now left Washington, D.C. Last year it was in Chicago, and this year in November it's going to be in Phoenix. And I've got some cards about it here um, uh, that are on the table. Uh, a couple cards, one with general information and some with more specific information about the schedule. But if you're interested, there's going to be scientists there, including uh, Dr. Phil Horner from the University of Washington is going to be there, Dr. Wise Young from Rutgers. Uh, Douglas Kerr from the Miami Project, Stephen Davies from the University of Colorado, uh, uh, a panel of uh, people both from uh, academic research as well as from uh, 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 drug companies and other uh, places. Geron, hopefully, uh, what Edworth from Geron, yeah, Edworth, the president of Geron, who's running this trial that started yesterday. Um, it's uh, an amazing experience to meet and talk to these people and learn what they're doing and also to meet other people who are advocating for um, uh, spinal cord injury research. Uh, uh, so that I think covers what I want to say. After my injury, I guess the first two weeks were spent trying to decide, and I, I think I took a line from a movie here, it's either get busy living or get busy dying because not everybody can deal with this situation. Most of the people in my personal life pretty much came and said, I don't know how you do it. I couldn't do it. And some people are built to be able to do certain things with life, especially a life-changing situation like this, and some can't. Uh, so I consider my background, uh, military, business, education, everything kind of honed me uh, for doing what I do and for... Uh, my emotional state for capability, different things. Um, I think that you have to use the skill set that you're given. Um, I learned one thing actually from all, uh, all people I never would have thought I'd learn anything from was Rutch Limbaugh, if everybody knows him. Uh, he was a very articulate, is a very articulate person, and uh, I learned a little bit about vocabulary and articulating how to speak to people how to listen to people, um, and then that helps as well. Um, so 
So anyway, after the first two weeks, I, I'm just like a sponge, I guess. Uh, I, I couldn't learn enough, couldn't learn fast enough. Um, and I wanted to give back. Uh, I'd spent so many years, um, maybe flaws uh, I'd like to have changed in my marriage, uh, the way I conducted myself, whatever. I felt that now I had some time uh, to try to pass along some things that I'd learned in life, uh, maybe do some injury prevention uh, speaking, things like that. Um, and after I'd learned enough and thought it was something I could do, and I moved on and uh, started with a group uh, called Think First, which some of you may remember from back in the day. Uh, it's no longer with us. Um, they trained us to be, uh, at first, associate speakers. Uh, you'd write your story. Uh, you'd have a time constraint as very much as we have tonight. Um, you tell your story, uh, strong points, what you did, how you overcame it, what you are able to do, what you do now, um, things like that. Um, then you, at some point, graduate through matri matriculation onto a lead speaker role, and you coordinate a little bit more with the facility you'd be speaking at, with the associate that you'd be working with and whatnot. And I guess that's where I got my start. Um, I find that in a day-to-day -day approach, you have to have a sense of humor. You have to articulate your needs. You have to speak audibly uh, as best you can and approach most situations with sugar as opposed to vinegar. A lot of people will feed you back the same thing you feed them. Uh, I, I don't know if the person that I'm about to approach has had a fight with their significant other this morning. I don't want to intensify that and make my situation worse, so I'm going to try to approach it in a positive light in the hopes that that will come back to me. In some cases it does, in some cases it doesn't. But either way, you might be improving someone else's day, but you wouldn't want your day started that way. So you probably don't want to do it to someone else. Um, I also work for a Sound Transit Advisory Board. When they first started conducting surveys of putting in the heavy rail, as far as the rail stops and different ways of accessibility in that regard. Um, I did some work with the King County Advisory Board specific to uh, Park Lake Homes in South Seattle. I don't know if anybody's familiar, but they tore down the old military barracks, uh, Rat City, uh, that kind of thing, and built some new housing. I was on a board that uh, we went through the uh, community needs and aspects of ADA and requirements for housing people with disabilities, elderly, et cetera. Uh, I was a PVA ad advocacy director for about a year, year and a half, uh, until I moved overseas. Um, I lived in the Philippines for four years um, in this situation. By the way, a di uh, not a disclaimer, a late fact, I forgot to bring it up. I'm a C5 quad yeah, complete. I missed that earlier. Um, and I did uh, a lot of work uh, with the VA with the uh, PVA advocacy uh, issue. Uh, a lot of complaints, things people didn't know how to deal with, that they were facing with the hospital they didn't think was fair. Uh, I'd get information, get feedback from the board, whatever, and we'd approach it accordingly. Uh, spent a lot of time at Metro Public Hearings, uh, going to advocate for not raising the uh, fares for disability people, elderly, um, different uh, aspects. I can't think of everything that comes to mind. Um, Connected with the Think First, uh, go, ba go back to that. I'm sorry, I'm a little disorganized. Um, we, I, I think a lot of younger people, they learn from having direct contact with a person with a disability. Their parents don't teach them because their parents don't have direct contact in most cases. But I find that in a bus ride or giving an auditorium assembly to a bunch of young people, they have no idea what you've been through, what you go through, how your life is different. Um, how you've got to approach most situations differently than they do, how much less freedom and control you have over your life than they do. And they learn a lot, and you also can teach a lot about injury prevention to, so that the same thing that's happened to you doesn't happen to them. And I think that that's great, because we never had that. What happened to me, I had no idea could happen to me. Uh, one day your whole life is different, and I wish I had somebody to come to me when I was a kid and say, you know, this is possible. This is just how quick it happens. This is, you just not paying attention, you're not aware, whatever. There's always a safer way to do things. Helmets uh, with skateboards, bikes, stuff. We never had that when I was a kid. Um, and the last thing I wanted to say is I was on the country doctor board of directors. That was something really unique for me. 
I didn't know anything about Country Doctor, and I've been approached to do a lot of different things, and uh, I did that, and it was uh, very enlightening. I find that uh, as a speaker, as a volunteer, as in the field of advocacy, you've got to pick your battles in life, and you've got to pick your volunteer efforts, your speaking engagements. It's just like if you hit the lottery, hands and mouths come from nowhere. Can I get some of that? Uh, it's the same with this. If you're good at what you do and you have a positive attitude, uh, your time is going to be taken up just like your money will be taken away from you. you can, you've got to budget yourself and you've got to pick a direction and, uh, and engage as best you can. I'd like to actually start, if you don't mind, asking some folks some questions. And Bruce, I was actually curious for you, at what point were you really ready to move out of kind of doing the self-advocacy of kind of working on getting as much function back to really going out into the world and doing the advocacy that you've been doing now? Well, um, like I say, it, it started a bit when I, I worked on that political campaign, and that was um, a little over a year after I was injured, a year to a year and a half after I was injured. Um, I was still at that time pretty much fully in a wheelchair, was still pretty, uh, pretty weak and messed up. And, uh, but I had time on my hands, and I was bored and tired of not doing anything. So that's where it started, and, and over time as I became stronger, I uh, um, began doing more and more. And then in 2005, I started working full-time. I worked as a software engineer, and uh, that's made it a little more difficult. But still, uh, uh, yeah, still, still definitely possible, and still, mm -hmm. I'm still involved and I still have this half hope that maybe as the economy recovers you're right now trying to do a traffic ticket bill or anything isn't going to happen cuz you know they're looking for money everywhere but maybe as the economy recovers uh I still have hope that maybe that kind of bill could be resurrected and we could do something with that again absolutely actually it makes me want to ask you a question Todd if it's okay how do you balance <laughs> Todd, um, how do you balance out uh, your very busy work life with your foundation and just even kind of your self advocacy because that takes a lot of time too it does I have a, a full time job as um, I, uh, chief of operations for a, a medical company downtown Seattle we make a anatomical pathology software and so in addition to that, you know, as the executive director of the foundation, trying to get that going, and then just the you know maintenance of quadriplegia, that's a full-time job as well. I do. I mean, my life's nuts. I don't. You know, it's, uh, I, don't s I don't sleep very much, and I'm just passionate, man. I'm German. Um, <laughs> you know. <laughs> When I, uh, you know, when I get to retire the Earth suit, I, I want the world to be a better place, and so I think you do it one heart at a time. And um, I'm just really good at not really caring about myself. She, Kathy's over there staring at me. She's not good, <laughs> um, but I just care about every pe everybody else really. And, um, and it's sort of a it's a blessing and a curse. And it's my story, and I'm the author of it. And uh, I'm just really passionate about people. And uh, I believe in people, and I believe in the power of, of, of your mind. And uh, I think we as a group should come together and take care of each other, and we're doing a really crappy job at it. And so I want to be a part of helping out. So I don't know. It's just what you do. You, you, you sleep when you can, and you work hard. And, you know, when I'm dead, I'll be dead. I mean, so right now it's, a, it's an honor to live here, and it's a real gift. And uh, consider uh, uh, this to be a blessing. So I, uh, I'd be a fool if I wasted it. So. That is a struggle, though, isn't it? To balance out taking care of yourself with doing all these other activities and managing all the other things that you do. Um, Aditya, could you respond a little bit to that, too? How do you kind of balance that out a little bit? Yeah. I was not balancing it out for a long time. So for um, 
since I've gotten injured to maybe uh, about six months to a year ago, I really wasn't spending much time on um, taking care of myself psychologically. Physically, I was really anal about all of that, you know, um, and, you know, the tiniest thing would set me into anxiety mode, um, which was good because then I stayed out of the hospital, even though I drove people around me a little batty sometimes. Um, but it, it's good in a way, a little bit of anxiety about um, possible health issues is good, um, is a good thing. But balancing that with the need to look at yourself and the need to take care of yourself emotionally is always a tricky part. Balancing is just inherently tricky um, and difficult. And so after a long time of kind of not um, worrying about myself or feeling bad for my situation and doing these other things, I was advocating for um, different social justice issues at school um, with different groups on campus and around Seattle, spending my, a lot of time doing that and writing for the paper and uh, doing all these other things. I didn't have much time to look at my situation very well. And so finally it caught up to me. Um, it was kind of triggered by a breakup um, of my then girlfriend, but it brought up all these issues of things that I have difficulty doing or will have difficulty doing in the future, um, you know, traveling around the world or um, having a typical relationship with someone um, in that, you know, I can't just, or it's difficult for me to just pass out at someone's house, you know, if I get, you know, I, I can't just go out drinking all night and then sleep over at my girlfriend's house, you know, that's, these are things that I knew but didn't think about until someone was kind enough to remind me. Um, um, no, but these type of things are, I think, important to always have in the back of your mind. And it hurts sometimes, especially people with, you know, long-term injuries, to be reminded of them. And it's easy, it was easy for me just to not think about it too much because it was a tiny problem. You know, my little difficulties were tiny problems compared to the problems of the world and the things that I was involved with. But like Jeannie and, you know, most of the, the people at the hospital who've been doing this for a while um, know it's you really have to find a balance and take care of yourself, maybe not first and foremost, but make sure you take care of yourself along the way or you're not going to be advocating for anyone else very well or for very long in a, any sort of sustainable manner. Tom, do you have anything you wanted to add on that topic? I think it's a thing that all of us uh, try and work on is how do you manage yourself as well? I think I'd add the word flexibility to, to balance. Uh, for me also, a lot of it's about strategy. I'm a type A personality, uh, actually a lot more so before than I am now because I forfeit a lot of control, and that's probably one of the hardest things to do with this. But when you deal with personalities, other people, I, I, I believe in do unto others philosophy. It works really well for me. Uh, you can't be overbearing. You got to be flexible. You got to be kind. You got to be respectful. What would another person feel if they were treated negatively, disrespectfully, whatever? So you balance it out the same way you forfeit control. You balance that out. You find a routine that works. I got caregivers that usually stick with me for a couple of years, Todd. I know you're jealous. Uh, <laughs> but uh, you, you just you, you go into it up front. You tell them, here's what my needs are. Here's what I think is fair. I'm going to pay you well. Uh, you're going to treat me well. And as long as we have a mutual respect uh, and appreciation, uh, you know, I'll never mistreat you. If I do, I'll apologize. It's a relationship, just like you have a personal relationship with somebody with a caregiver. So... You do it with a caregiver, you do it with other people you come across in life, people you meet, strangers on the street, kids, people you advocate for, uh, people you speak to in Congress. Everybody's on a budget, everybody's on a time constraint. It's, it's just a matter of respect and, and, and being fair to each other as people. Uh, I think we've gotten away from that a lot more with the high tech. As I get older, I remember times past when people used to interact People used to go out in the street and play instead of locking themselves in their rooms till 5 o'clock in the morning playing video games and 
texting people. It's so impersonal. Uh, I think getting out and talking to people and interacting with people is a lost art. If you wouldn't mind, Bruce, maybe you can start and we'll ask everybody this question as well. Is it what advice would you give to somebody who's thinking about advocacy and thinking about trying to do something that's, um, you know, kind of an outside outside of you? You guys have all done things that are for the community or for outside of you and not just for people with spinal cord injury, but for other people as well. Good question. Uh, I uh, um, I think it's important to find something you're passionate about that's interesting to you that you know that engages. Um, because uh, if I if I if I'm not feeling the passion, if I'm not really motivated, I, it's going to be really hard to do all the work that it takes to do something. You know, you know to to get a bill passed, uh, or to get, uh, um, you know, maybe even something as simple as uh, planting flowers or something to beautify your neighborhood, or um, uh, to really to advocate for yourself and your own health, uh, it takes it takes a level of passion and commitment, and uh, so. Uh, so I, I, mean, I, w I would begin by suggesting you know find find something that really uh, really does interest you and uh, and follow it and meet other people that are interested in the same thing and find them wherever you know uh, through well things like this through uh, through the internet of course uh, through other you know wherever it is people get together a about the particular cause or issue or thing that you're interested in, um, it really can't be done alone, and it's it can be very discouraging to try and do something just by yourself. But uh, uh, there's strength in numbers for sure. The advice that I would give to anyone that wants to see something done um, is probably the same as the other panelists have said. And that is, don't try to do it by yourself. You will probably burn out after a little while. Um, the history of social change, you know, throughout, not just say the last hundred years, has been of groups like this, probably smaller, getting together and seeing some problem, and working, you know, tirelessly when uh, on the weekends, um, in between jobs, you know, in their free time, um, working despite many setbacks and despite, you know, repeated failures uh, until something happens, until, you know, limited successes take place and not quitting. It's, it worked the same way for the Americans with Disabilities Act, worked the same way for the women's movement, for the earth movement, for, um, for every, every uh, social change in, you know, in the, in the history of humanity. So um, that type of strength, not only in numbers, but strength in other people who feel strongly about um, the same issues you do is really empowering. And like Tom said, it's unfortunate that society has become a little bit more atomized and individualized, but we can change that just by going to events like this and getting in touch with other people who want to advocate on something um, that you're interested in. Um, and also not sleeping and working like a madman like Tom, uh, like Todd. That's it's always good to have those people around too. So those diamonds with the work done. That's right, baby. Exactly. Yeah, you have other. <laughs> um, <coughs> I mean, they've all said it. Uh, I mean, you just got to be ready, man. You know, pick up a shovel and start doing your thing. So anyone can do it. Absolutely. If we're doing it, then you all can do it, too. <laughs> Any other questions or comments at this point from the audience? Yeah, in back. So sharing your vision. Uh, well, I've got a couple of them. But uh, the one, the main one, is, uh, and is, a, is a bold comment. I'd like to see another C1 to C4 complete quadriplegic 
gainfully employed in this country, not on government subsidies, with private insurance, um, and paying their caregiving bill all on their own, who didn't come into the paralysis with um, cash. Give me another one, please, because I'd like to talk to him or her. That's that's what I want to do. I want to see more of us. The injury actually um, sensitized me, if that's the right word, to other people suffering a lot more than I was before. I wouldn't say I was indifferent or non-empathetic before, but I was involved with you know, average teenage things and, um, you know, going out and surfing and hanging out with friends, whatever. Um, but afterwards, I realized, wow, this this is a really profound situation that you found yourself in. Um, there probably won't be a way to pay back or, um, you know, pay back the people that have helped me along the way. But you could use this time, as Todd said, um, your limited time, on this planet to do good, um, you know, to do justice. And I think that has been one of uh, the more significant impacts that the injury has had on me um, to clarify um, a vision, even a general direction of where um, one is headed, where one um, ought to be headed in my view. Um, where what that means in practical terms is you know, the age-old dilemma of transferring your ideological goals into something that's going to pay your bills. But, um, you know, there's, there's plenty of time for that. One of my visions is that uh, uh, I was seeing this clinical trial start yesterday, but to see that we have more clinical trials of therapies for people with spinal cord injury, both acute spinal cord injury, early injuries, as well as those of us with chronic injuries, uh, long-term injuries. Uh, just would really like to see more research getting from the lab into the clinic and a time when uh, somebody who suffers a spinal cord injury um, uh, will have a lot more hope in terms of the recovery options they have as well as those of us who um, have lived with it for even many years uh, have some hope as well that uh, um, that these scientists are going to crack this nut and uh, um, make some really cool things happen. That's what I'd like to see. If I understand this correctly, you're asking what opportunities presented themselves that you just took advantage of that is kind of put you in these positions or created? Uh, <laughs> when um, I was a younger guy, I um, was uh, able to take advantage of um, a company called Nintendo. At that point, they had this little 8-bit you know, game system, and uh, Children's was a, a beta site for a controller. Uh, that was made uh, for folks who couldn't move their hands. So um, I just sort of got into that and ended up, you know, flying around the country being a model for Nintendo. And that was really fantastic. And that was an opportunity that uh, I didn't even know, you know, could even exist. And I did that for uh, for a long time. And that was uh, something that I, I really enjoyed. And, and uh, that really began to sort of install in me that um, I have a particular skill set. Um, it's birthed out of uh, complete pain and suffering, um, but uh, if I tool it correctly, I can you know, make it a revenue engine. And so that's what I'm trying to do, I'm trying to use something absolutely horrible that nobody should go through, and I'm going to use it to do good. As far as opportunities, I just took everyone that was interesting to me as I possibly could that came by. So from that, naturally, once you get your once you get your footrest in the door, um, it really helps <laughs> because uh, I know it's terrible. <laughs> it's ter <laughs> just deal with it, all right? <laughs> um, uh, say for example, um, there was student senate 
in uh, at the UW. Um, so I did that for a couple of years. And at times it was really tedious. But through that, I got to um, personally talk to uh, Patty Murray about a piece of legislation that I wrote for the Senate. I mean, this was in the big scale of things. It was kind of not that consequential because she said, oh, yeah, I'll, I'll definitely consider this because um, I asked her not to vote. Um, or vote against a resolution that would have favored bombing Iran. Um, but next, like two weeks later, she voted for it anyway. So um, this is the, there's a lesson in this. D despite your best interest, despite all the opportunities that come by, you're going to have setbacks. And so that type of resilience and flexibility and keeping long-term goals in mind is, uh, is, a, is a virtue. And not refusing opportunities that come by, um, even if they don't seem like, even if they, they don't seem like the opportunities you think are, um, or even if they don't seem like what you think an opportunity should look like, um, it's a good chance to uh, just get, um, get some experience and do what you can um, with your time. I'll jump in for a 15 second funny. Uh, for folks in wheelchairs, next time you're in a department store and you're shopping for clothing, um, work with the, the gal or guy that's fitting your clothes and, and just say, does, uh, does this wheelchair make my butt look too big? Okay. <laughs> it's uh, it's a lighten up the mood a little bit, okay? It's a funny one, trust me. Yeah, well, I've, I'm, uh, I guess I find I'll get an idea in my head and it just can't like I can't get rid of it and it keeps following me around and uh, doing whatever and, and an example of that that I'm thinking of is uh, in 2004 I had the good fortune to go to a be a part of a clinical trial at the University of Florida of body weight supported treadmill training and it was it was very helpful to me I spent three months down living in a hotel in Gainesville and doing this treadmill training. And uh, left, left here walking with forearm crutches and came back using a cane. And uh, when I came back, I was just thinking, you know, people that need this kind of therapy or that, you know, need exercise therapy shouldn't have to go to Florida or California or wherever to get this, um, you know, beyond what you can do. I mean, I'd, I'd been upstairs on the eighth floor doing physical therapy for over a year and a half, um, and was just, you know, they were they were sick and tired of me. <laughs> no, uh, no, no. Um, <laughs> they kind of were, but that's okay. And uh, um, so. So I came back and I had this idea in my head and a few months later I came to the Spinal Cord Injury Forum and I met Al and Sharon Northup who are here who uh, are the founders of Pushing Boundaries and um, in over time we uh, together have you know a place where had that been around in 2004 I would have not had to go to uh, to Florida so I guess that's how that's how opportunities happen for me. They just, you know, they're stuck in my head until I, something happens or something else gets stuck. Well, um, we are actually just about out of time, and I wanted to uh, actually have an opportunity to thank you guys. This is very wonderful. I really appreciate it, and I think they deserve a round of applause. Thank you all for being here.